Welcome, Governor. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much for coming down this afternoon. I know you had a busy morning, so I appreciate you. Uh... Yeah, pleasure. I'm on my way to Chile. Is that right? Yeah. So. Well, it's pretty chill, awfully chilly here already. Do you still have that in Not in Chile, Chile it isn't. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, it's an interesting day, so I'd like to actually start off by asking a little bit about the, uh, the announcement today. So um, uh, the Bank of Canada, you're in your monthly rate an announcement, said that um, inflation has risen by more than expected and the, uh, the output gap, that is to say the amount of slack <clears throat> left in the economy, is smaller than you had thought back in October. Right. So there's a view out there that this suggests that you're getting per perhaps itchier to get the process of tightening monetary policy along sooner. Is that the right interpretation? Uh, what's the right context for thinking about those factors? Okay, well, that's, uh, boy, that's a nice technical question to start off with, uh, Greg. Uh, so uh, what, what's going on there? For, of course, everybody knows we had a, last week we got the data, it was a strong quarter. So it was a little more than almost anybody uh, expected, so that's point number one. But at the same time, we get revisions to the history, so, which were stronger. There's been more GDP than, than we thought before. So what that means is, as of today, the level of GDP is higher than we thought it would be, and we thought, and then we thought it was. So our models automatically allocate some of that to supply, i.e. capacity, and some to demand. And the math of it is that the gap, as measured in that mechanical way, is a little smaller than what we had listed in our NPR uh, six weeks ago. So that's just full disclosure. Uh, we think there's plenty of capacity in the economy, uh, we take a comprehensive measure of how much capacity there is, including labor market indicators, output indicators, a uh, wide range of things go into that thing, and the fact is there's a lot of room for the economy to grow. So if you're changing that room by 0.1 or 0.2, it's not a very big change. Now, um, almost perhaps more important is for the outlook is like how fast does that gap close yeah. from its slightly smaller level today? Right. And there you had some, there are some negatives, right? Right. Uh, and on, on balance, so you talked about, you've got on the positive <clears throat> side, the stronger US economy, but on the negative side, uh, you have um, the weaker oil prices. How do those things net out? Does, it, does the path for growth look a little bit weaker as a consequence of those developments? Or stronger? Um, well, we haven't done a full-blown uh, forecast, uh, Greg. We do that four times a year, and we do that each time we publish the Monetary Policy Review, uh, sorry, Monetary Policy Report, NPR, which will uh, be in January. And, of course, we did it in October. So in between, uh, you know, we, we take these things and, uh, and analyze them in a more, let's say, rudimentary fashion. And so we would ask, well, what are the risks to the story that we gave six weeks ago? Uh, well, at the time, oil prices had already started to fall, um, but they've clearly fallen quite a bit further since then. So that's a downside risk to output and obviously to inflation, both directly and because lower output would mean a slower closure of that gap. So uh, the, the profile for inflation, for that reason alone, would be revised down if we were doing a new pro, uh, projection today. But there are some offsets which make it more of a risk as opposed to a mechanical thing. So yes, the U.S. economy is showing more encouraging signs. We're happy with that. And we can see it in our exports, so it's actually working. And we got more investment spending in our national accounts, so that's the next linkage that we're watching for. Uh, so those exporting companies investing in more capacity and creating new jobs. And so we did get some stronger employment data the last two months. So, we do think that the pieces we've been watching for have begun to fall into place. And I'm really careful to say it's not done. And we need many months of this before we're, we're confident. And, and economic data never go in a straight line. But, the, but bottom line is the offsets make it so that it's a risk management question. So yes, oil prices are definitely a negative uh, for the economy and for the inflation outlook, offsetting that a little more growth from the U.S., which is helping us through the export side and investment side. And secondly, the exchange rate depreciation, which has come with the fall in oil prices, therefore offsets part of the negative effect. And a third thing that has happened is in that time period, the government announced some you know, income splitting and um, a couple other tax changes, which are not a trivial effect on aggregate demand. So that's another plus or a little bit of downside insurance, if you like. 
Um, is the impact on inflation of all these factors larger than just what um, the, the growth effect would imply? So in other words, you've talked, uh, the, the inflation profile, has it, does, does that look like it's likely to change substantially as a result of some of these factors like the dollar depreciation and the, the yeah. oil price movement over and above whatever the growth, ne negative growth impacts are? So uh, that, that is a, I know that sounds like an easy question to you, Greg, but that's not. That's a very complicated <laughs> question. Uh, so the, the inflation profile, meaning the path from now for the next couple of years, uh, will the will in the near term be pushed down because the oil prices will directly push that down. Um, and then the question though is what is the underlying force on inflation? And that would come primarily from growth and how the labor market gets drawn in, how the gap closes in the labor market. We know we have a lot of excess capacity in the labor market. And so the pace at which that gets drawn out is a very uh, hard thing to uh, estimate. Um, but we're confident that the direction is right. And so if I say to you, well, we think it'll take around two years to use up the excess capacity, and when I say around, if it were six months longer or six months less, that would be all fair game to an economist, and you know that. So, so and actually that's a lot of precision right there. <laughs> So, so we still think, you know, we have around two years worth of growth in there uh, above potential growth before we would use up our excess capacity. And um, the numbers, we just don't know. I said before, we, we're estimating that the economy will grow somewhere between two and two and a half percent over that period. That's a little bit above potential, so I should close our gap. Uh, but if you take off 0.25 or 0.3 or 0.4 even because of oil prices with all those net effects taken out, then you see you're getting closer to two than to two and a half. So that's the kind of zone that we're in. So I'm trying to do the math. So how many more months? Uh, six more months maybe? Well, you know, this is the thing. It's, uh, it's a, you know, roughly two years because that's the horizon we use to yeah. do policy in. We, we, we want inflation to be yeah. sustainably at 2% within around two years. That's the credibility or accountability we put around it. Uh, just to drill down on the oil price thing, I think uh, when you testified to the Senate a few weeks ago, yeah. you had said that at that point, the weakness in the oil price would take about a quarter point off uh, Canada's That's growth. Right. Can you update that figure given how much further oil prices have since fallen? Yeah, uh, by that same uh, metric, it would be, you know, say a third of a point. So it'd be like another, it's like 50% more than the 0.25, okay. right? Um, and but again, so that's taking account of it's negative for us. It reduces the amount of income falling into Canada. But in the short term, it's good for consumers, right? Because they got a little little extra money left over after they fill their gas tank. So you take all those things into account, and it's better for an economy like the U.S. So it boosts U.S. growth. Mm -hmm. So you take all of those things into account before deciding that. And uh, we haven't done the uh, the second decimal point. Uh, work yet. So, well, allow course, me that. Yes, and of course, that's the one that we in the media will always focus on. You changed yeah. the second decimal point. That's uh, yes. we have to write every day, not every month. Right. Um, the um, <laughs> uh, speaking of what we're going to write about today, um, <clears throat> a lot of attention to the fact that you uh, flagged significant risks to financial stability from household imbalances. Yes, we did. Uh, I think a, a month ago, the language seemed a little bit more benign, uh, financial risks uh, edging upwards. So yes. uh, what are we to make of that? How much more concerned, if at all, are you about household imbalances? Well, uh, we've, we've been concerned about uh, uh, household imbalances for quite a long time. And in our FSR, which, by the way, is a financial system review, will be published a week from today, there will be a very fulsome analysis of, of uh, these, uh, these risks. And so we consider that, that, well, that's a source of vulnerability for the economy, not necessarily something that's an accident going to happen, but rather it's vulnerable and increasingly vulnerable to an outside shock, such as an increase in unemployment or uh, an unexpectedly quick rise in interest rates or something like that, mortgage rates. So those kinds of shocks then would give you the risk. So the vulnerability has been high for some time, and it's been our number one risk to the Canadian situation for a long time. So we called it significant last year. We called it significant earlier this year. And we called it significant today. But in October, what we observed was, in fact, uh, rather than holding stable or constructively evolving, which is what we were thought we saw during the winter and the spring, 
the household imbalances issue had started to edge higher. And so that's what we said in October, it's edging higher. Edging higher actually was, you know, a signal that it's getting a little worse. Whereas today, six weeks later, we don't have any new data and we have no reason to know whether it's edged even higher or edged lower. We just know it's significant. Your word before it, so you're there still was no So there was no change in view. <laughs> There's no change in the importance of that issue to be, to be seen in that word significant. That's, uh, I don't normally like to parse these things, but that just shows you how, how important one word can be. So um, from, the, uh, from the delicate job of balancing so many factors as the central bank, on the one hand, you still have uh, this gap, mm. this uh, slack in the labor market, which calls for all else equal easier monetary policy. But on the other hand, you have these building financial imbalances, and yeah. you've seen central banks in other countries like Sweden and Norway try to grapple with these competing um, uh, priorities. How do you deal with that. You've talked about risk management, for example. How do you reconcile those two separate risks, which in, you know, conceptually call for a different direction in monetary policy? Right. So we, we, we think of this as, a, as you say, a risk management problem as opposed to a pure mechanical or engineering problem. A lot of, a lot of uh, folks would think that monetary policy is almost like reverse engineering. If inflation is supposed to be at 2% two years from now, all you have to do is use your model to figure out what What's, has, what's happened between now and then. And, and literally that's, that's true, except for all the things you don't actually know. And there are a lot of those. And so uh, we did a lot of work in this past cycle to help people understand where the uncertainty actually goes and what we do about it in the policy discussion. We don't just ignore it, pretend it's not there. We actually have it on the table. So we don't know what potential is or what the gap is. Really, we think it's between this and this. Well, if you take that kind of notion and put that on the table and say, well, if it's between this and this, this could happen or this could happen. Are we comfortable with both of those outcomes? And you say, yeah, uh, it, there's a risk that this is true and there's a risk that that's true, and either one of those, we're okay with that. Or if we weren't, then we would need to adjust things to hedge those risks. You see what I mean? So then what happens is, well, that's the, the inflation problem. And then we say, OK, but what about these imbalances or financial stability risks? And sometimes they, it's as if if you were, say, the economy was, looked like it might say oil price shock was really big. And you think, oh, we should cut interest rates to, to compensate, to get the economy going again. Uh, but then you might think, well, that could make those household imbalances worse. So there's a little bit of a trade off there. So what you do then is you say, well, um, in the inflation problem, when will we get back home? And if it's around two years from now on our best uh, forecast, then we say, OK, that's, that's good. And that means we can be flexible about when we move. Do we move now or tomorrow or not? And, and since household imbalances are still edging higher, let's say, we'd prefer not to do anything right now. You see, see what I mean yeah. by the risk management? So yeah. the risk management means that you're in a zone where you're just as you're uncomfortable, but you're as comfortable as you can be. And I think that's uh, an important bit of realism in policymaking, because we don't really know everything. Is it fair to say that interest rates are higher than they otherwise would be because of the presence of the uh, household imbalances? No. Uh, we, have, we have never uh, been pushed into a, a few, the true trade-off in that sense. Uh, but what I mean is that, in a sense, when you're, when you're considering your tactics, you would ask, well, is there any risk to the inflation outlook posed by holding still? And the answer is no. Then you go, then that's what we're going to do, because we don't actually know enough to pinpoint that we should be moving anyway. And for me, uh, using interest rates to somehow reduce uh, financial stability risk um, is really the last, you know, it's, it's, it, it can work, but it's the, the last line of defense. The first line of defense um, is people making their own decisions, and it's their banker making the decision with them. And it, the next line is supervision and the rules yeah. around that and macroprudential policies, tweaks to the, uh, to the mortgage market, for example. And then, as a last resort, well, there's interest rates. For us, what's more likely to resolve or ease uh, these financial uh, uh, stability issues is the economic recovery that we're fostering. So as that happens, more people get jobs, there's more income, 
and the ratio of debt to income starts to go down because there's more income and more jobs. That's the natural process, and that's the way I think it will be resolved. It's not going to suddenly stop all by itself with interest rates at 1%. Those things will probably continue to edge higher until the economic growth from, behind, from underneath fixes it for us, and that, that's how I expect it to happen. So Aditya uh, Narain from the IMF today, he, um, we were talking about financial stability issues earlier, right. and he pointed out that uh, most of the really severe financial crises have been set off by a housing bust that interacts with the banking system. And I haven't done the numbers myself, <clears throat> but the, uh, historically, the type of run-up in home values and associated debt that you've had in Canada have, his have often been followed by a severe uh, bust and uh, financial instability. How confident are you that Canada can break that mold, that, that past will not be prologue? Yes, well, that, that's, uh, I'm quite confident, actually. And uh, so the, there are, we have two significant episodes like that on record, the 1981-82 uh, the one and then the 1991 one. And uh, in both of those cases, we had emerging inflation pressures in general in the run-up. And we had a very sharp run up in house prices. And you know, on the chart, in both cases, the, the run up looks like the left hand side of an Eiffel Tower. And while when I was working at BCA research, we always used to say, if you see the left hand side of an Eiffel Tower, the right hand side is coming. <laughs> and, and, and in both those cases, it was true. And the reason it was true was not because of housing. It was because there were inflation pressures in general interest rates began to rise, and a recession happened. And that vulnerability that I talked about before was then realized by rising unemployment and rising interest rates, both at the same time. So, but what's different about this time is that house prices have been rising like for like six years. Um, and if you're worried about overvaluation in that basic sense, well, they've been overvalued in that basic sense for quite a long time was a very gradual rise, not the left-hand side of an Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we believe is that as long as we don't have some other shock, such as a global shock that causes us to have another recession, that vulnerability remains just a vulnerability, not a risk that gets realized. The economy recovers, and that makes all that sort of validated by stronger growth. People fret over this, but you know, that's why you cut interest rates. You cut interest rates to cushion the economy. Well, what do you expect to happen? People are going to buy houses and they're going to buy cars. Well, we've been doing that now for six years to cushion the economy. Nobody thought it would last this long, but that's allowed those things to build more. Um, but I think that uh, there's, there's no fundamental danger there of it's, of it's happening all by itself. It is vulnerable. Um, let's turn to the sort of the medium-term growth outlook uh, for a bit. Now, we've heard a lot of discussion today, a lot of concern about Canada's ability and uh, whether it has the resources and the assets to, to grow rapidly in the future, especially from the point of view of productivity and uh, innovation and entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the bank in its own reports on the Canadian economy has highlighted the relatively disappointing performance of productivity in recent years. Yeah. It looks like, I think, by your own measures, potential growth is around two versus three, I think, uh, a decade ago. What has dragged Canada's potential and productivity growth down, and what are the prospects for turning that around? What, what steps can the country take? How likely is it to turn around, and what can uh, the country, do, Canada, do to hurry up the process? Right. Well, um, there's a lot in there, uh, but the most important reason why Canada's trend growth rate is decelerating from what used to be a close to 3% towards 2% is because uh, folks in my age group are getting ready to retire. We're the baby boomers who have you know, boosted our labor force for the past 50 years are now starting to fall out of the labor force. And that big hump is coming off like that. And that's not just here in Canada. But globally, global growth is slowing down for that structural reason. And you can offset that with a bit more productivity, perhaps. You know, you can invent some robots or things you know, that somehow or, you know, like the big inventions in the past that did things like the steam engine or the flush toilet or these kinds of major changers, uh, they're, they're not the same as getting the latest version of the iPhone compared to the previous version, right? 
So, so we, we, you need some sort of breakthrough to actually break that trend. So we're not forecasting this. But productivity in Canada has always been, and always for a mass number of years, been a lagger. And, uh, and interestingly, it has picked up quite dramatically in the past year. Now, the story I would put behind that is, yeah, we were, uh, you know, I can't really explain under performance that well. Every company I talk to has got great productivity. So it seems like productivity is everywhere except in the statistic. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, and, and there may be some truth to that, more than just a joke. But anyway, it's very hard to measure, in other words, right? But what has happened is over the course of this prolonged recession, slow growth period, was we had a lot of destruction in the, in the export sector. Uh, we know that something like eight to 10,000 companies are gone who were there before. Um, now, if you, and that's of course the combination of really a big collapse in export demand, the dollar rose at the same time, kind of a, the worst possible uh, combination for many of those companies. So you've got to know that the companies with the, with the uh, you know, that, that were lagging in terms of productivity or cost performance are amongst those. So as the demand is coming back, companies that are fulfilling those increase in exports are actually doing it with existing capacity. They're just starting a few of them to invest in new capacity now. So all that growth that we've had over the last year has been in productivity, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think the story is that the ones who have survived that very difficult down cycle post-crisis are those who are much higher level of productivity. And for, for survival, they had to do it even better than that. And so we're going to have a much better productivity performance as we get the rest of the recovery. And then we'll settle into this you know, 2% long-term growth rate. It's primarily the labor market inputs that causes yeah. that. Uh, you mentioned the strong dollar. In fact, um, many years ago, a, um, a British magazine called The Economist coined the term the Dutch disease to describe a situation where a country that had a resource boom ended up ex experiencing strong exchange rate appreciation, which crowded out its manufacturing sector. Is that what's happened to Canada in recent years? And if the resource boom is over, does that dynamic reverse? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've never been that comfortable with the the Dutch disease story, because it sounds like it, it ends, you know, with, with right there. Uh, but it's really only about half of the story. Uh, so what Canada's experienced is a very large increase in its term, what we call terms of trade, primarily oil prices, but not just oil prices. And that means the things that we export are worth more to the world than the things we import. So for every day, we're earning more money. Right? So that was from uh, 2002, for, for 10 years, steady rise um, uh, in the terms of trade, about 25%. That 25% rise in terms of trade translated into about 7% more income for everybody in Canada every single day. It doesn't happen just once, it's, it's as long as it stays like that. Now what we know is we've had a bit of an unwinding, right? All right, so but before we get to the unwinding, what happens? Here's the thing that they call Dutch disease, which is as that thing goes up, the dollar goes up with it. That's like a dog on a leash. The terms of trade looks like a dog on a leash and all the stretchy leashes. So the dollar follows the master, but doesn't quite perfectly follow the master. You get the idea. So anyway, uh, so the dollar goes up with it. And so that puts a squeeze on the manufacturing sector. And the signal is telling the economy to invest more in energy and less in manufacturing because we can make more money in energy. That's what the, the market is telling us. And that's what happens. And then people start moving to Alberta or to Newfoundland or wherever, wherever the oil is. And we saw all those things. So that's the first part of your story. Yep. But the other part is that we, the folks that make all that money doing that spend the money on stuff that's made all, everywhere. And so the income effect spreads across the entire country. And that's the second chapter that people don't talk about. It's the good news part of the, the rest of the Dutch disease story. And so it has a happy ending, except in the end, people have perhaps had to move. And you've had some pain, to admit it, in, say, the manufacturing sector. So now that we've had some reversal of that, does it unwind? These are things that move very slowly. 
and we still have a much higher terms of trade today than we had 10 years ago. So that effect and the sort of two-speed economy that we've had, I think will persist for some time, but I think the gap between them will probably narrow now um, as we get a, a little bit more balance across all the economy. And if we look at the latest data, boy, it's, it's the manufacturing sector that's really got to move on. Mm. And it's because the dollar and the stronger U.S. economy in the investment sector is having that direct impact. Um, today we've heard a lot of um, uh, angst and, uh, and discussion about how Canada can be more innovative and more entrepreneurial. A lot of the panels were devoted to this question of how do you get young people in Canada more interested in startups and so on. How do, they, how do you get capital those startups? How do you grow them? And get all the good macroeconomic benefits that come from that. Do you share that concern about Canada's lack of entrepreneurialism and how would you fix it? What are a few things the public and private sectors can do to generate stronger innovation and uh, entrepreneurialism in this country? Yeah, that's, that's a really big question. Um, I would be interested to hear what else people said about it today. But I mean, we, we, uh, the way I measure it is in the sense of uh, firm creation. Uh, and whether that's, that's, that's actually a step beyond the, on, the, the first discovery or the entrepreneurialism that, that you're talking about. But the process of firm creation is a natural process when growth is schumpeterian. It's all by itself, self-sustaining. So there's always new companies being invented and created. They create brand new jobs. They create the lion's share of new jobs in the economy. So usually when the economy is growing at a steady rate naturally, there will be 2 or 3% more companies in the economy every year. And that process stopped in 2008. Okay? So we've had this declining trend in the number of companies. And this is true in the US. It's true in the UK. It's true more generally. Hmm. And so we know that you know, when you look at the US economy, you say, oh, it's growing pretty well. Yeah, it's growing pretty well, but interest rates are zero. That's all induced. It's not natural yet. Okay? It's just maybe getting started. So we have to be patient as that starts. And I think firm creation then is going to really pick up. In the, we already see it in the UK, by the way. So I think then a little bit in the US. Here, our data are slower. We haven't got them yet. But I think uh, we're, I'm confident it will happen. And so when that happens is, you know, you're going to get this productivity happens out of thin air. You create a brand new company, brand new idea, and next thing you know, there's, there's, there's 12 people, 24 people, then there's 100 people working for that company, and they're making all kinds of dough. That's productivity out of thin air, and that's the part we've been lacking. So it sounds like what you're saying is that what a lot of us have come to worry is a secular problem of lack of innovation. It may just be a cyclical problem. I a think it's cycle, primarily, sure. it's a big cycle, a slow cycle, unfortunately, but I don't think it's secular. All right. Well, that's an incredibly uplifting message to end the day on. <laughs> Governor Polis, thank you very much for your time. I really yeah, appreciate you coming.